let's, let, let's say uh, that one of the things you might want to figure out, given the problems we've just been talking about, uh, is how you would use the supply chain of our enormously complex industries uh, to instantiate all of that extra legal community ecological requirement that, that we now have. Um, many years ago, uh, I was sitting in a vending area at Qualcomm with David Marr, whom, uh, well, David and I have been working together since the middle of last decade when we were making GPL3 and there was Sun Microsystems and Jonathan Schwartz was my favorite CEO and the reason he was my favorite CEO is he had the best lawyers and David was that. Um, and, and, and so here we were sitting in a vending area at Qualcomm and David was saying to me, you know, we could use the supply chain uh, in our industry because now here at Qualcomm I know an awful lot about that and free software, which he does. He's the world's leading accessible expert on this subject because the people who run supply chains like that with free software in it are way more secretive than David and Don Rosenberg and the lawyers at Qualcomm are. Um, uh, let, what could we do if we used the supply chain to squeeze 90% of the problems out? So we would be left with 10% of the problems and then we would know exactly what to do about the 10% of the problems where it's really hard to know what to do about the 100% of the problems. And we at Qualcomm, since we want to emit clean and we must take whatever comes to us, why don't we begin thinking about how to make what comes to us? That was the beginning of open chain. I had nothing to do then but admire it. I have nothing to do now but admire it. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary achievement and it is really beginning to occur. Um, and we are getting to the point where we can use another layer in the global market to do for us part of what we are trying to do here, which is to make stewardship work not by dispute but by win-win solution making. Uh, Shane Coughlin, well, Shane, um, I guess he was originally a competitor because FSF Europe needed to compete with what those North American guys do in free software law. Uh, and Georg Greve did the one really crucially important thing. He said, I must have one of the world's great obsessive administrators to do this work with me. Uh, and Shane created what was then the Free Software Foundation Europe's Freedom Task Force, which has now evolved into a worldwide community of lawyers talking about free software law in which even uh, people like me who can't stop yammering, yammer a little more carefully because everybody else is there. Uh, and that was Shane's first uh, effort. Um, Keith Bergelt, who has uh, gone away not to have to listen to me praise Shane too much, then used Shane to produce uh, the Open Invention Network's extraordinarily effective administrative world. And Shane has been working on Open Chain now for long enough that... Uh, I can see that David Moore is a little more relaxed because he now knows what it's like to have one of the world's great uh, obsessive builders and administrators doing the thing f with you. Uh, and the Linux Foundation wisely has absorbed Shane for the purpose of making open chain work. Uh, and these are uh, comrades who do have uh, a functional answer to some of the really important questions. And so I give you David Moore and Shane Koch. That, that reminds me of the first time I spoke with Shane. It was this guy on the phone trying to convince me that I ought to join this thing called the Freedom Task Force. And I was, and I was uh, in my office trying to, trying to listen to that, and I was like, wait a minute. So you're proposing that I volunteer my nights and weekends to take random calls from anybody in the open source and FOSS community and to just answer questions on a pro bono basis. And the guy's like, yeah. <laughs> so... You know, I. And it worked. You convinced me somehow. I said yes. It morphed into the legal network, which is now uh, sort of the most um, active online discussion area for uh, for legal issues related to FOSS. So, if you're not already part of that, I do encourage you to 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 join that. I'm really really glad to be working with Shane. So, to to Evan's point, you know, Evan used an example about sort of like you know um, water as it flows downhill. Um, and that's really a good analogy for the way supply chains work today. So you have, uh, and for years we've talked about these issues, you know, as in conferences, not unlike this one, but oftentimes you would get a bunch of corporate um, practitioners and they would be trading ideas and notes about 
what they were doing in terms of like open source policy and governance and source code availability and attributions and all these things that we were doing turned out to be awfully similar. Um, so that for the most part, the way that we ended up implementing were very consistent, but we, although we had the same problems, we weren't really trading um, operational best practices that allowed us to ease each other's work. If I provided software to the next person, I would provide them essentially the minimum compliance obligations. I would give them the attributions in a format that's probably not that usable to them. And they would essentially have to take that work and then redo all the work I just did. And it was sort of the cost of doing business at the time. And then came this notion where other people with good ideas came up with this idea called SPDX, which was like a lingua franca. It's a method for how attributions can be delivered from person to person, from entity to entity. And especially within these nested supply chains that we have today, it's a huge opportunity. Which brought to light another problem. Now that we have this lingua franca, how do we actually then start trusting the contents of it. And the issue there was we didn't have transparency, we didn't have an understanding of what went into building that attribution file. So unless we actually had some way of understanding like process conformity, that there were some basic hallmarks of quality associated with that, we wouldn't be able to actually resolve the issue of tremendous waste in the ecosystem, the whole redundant effort that was happening time and time again. So hence, Open Chain was born. Um, we socialized the concept. A number of major organizations joined it. Uh, so the companies now supporting Open Chain, Adobe, Arm, Cisco, Comcast, GitHub, Harman, Hitachi, HPE, Qualcomm, Siemens, Sony, Toyota, Western Digital, Wind River, these are companies that are very diverse and they're all impacted by open source practices and good compliance practices would benefit them and hence they support open chain. But if I, I show that list up there, what's, what's missing? Because there is a big um, opportunity for open chain that's not yet being capitalized upon so those are all US-based, European-based, Japan-based organizations. The opportunity here is to be a truly global process conformance standard and go into places like Taiwan and China and India. So with that, to talk about more about the details of Open Chain and how it's actually being run today, let me pass it over to Shane. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. So uh, I'm going to give you a bit of a whirlwind tour of what OpenChain is, what it's accomplished in recent times, and where it's going next. But before that, um, I would like to make sure that Dave gets great credit for being a mastermind, not only in coming up with the idea of OpenChain, but in socializing it with so many people and bringing together a great community over a period of almost three years, I believe, from idea to realization. Now, Open Chain today is distilled and concentrated into one simple concept. The idea is to address the question of how do I trust open source compliance in the supply chain? And this is a question of critical importance to any commercial entity dealing with open source and needing to address open source licenses. Very few, if any, companies today actually create things from beginning to end. The supply chains that we use are incredibly long, incredibly complex, and prone to all types of inadvertent error and concern. By and large, we do a terrific job of addressing the complexity of global supply chains. But in areas like open source compliance, there is significant room for optimization. There are three parts to the open chain project 
to help address the challenges around open source compliance in the supply chain. The first and the most important part of open chain is a specification, a standard, which we use to help create a level and clearly understood playing field for open source compliance. The second part is conformance to help people adhere to the spec. And the third part is a curriculum to help people understand what all of this means and what type of knowledge already exists in the market space. So the open chain specification, as I said, is the keystone of the project. It outlines the key requirements for a quality open source program. It's a big picture spec. It does not cover the details of what specific implementation of a process you would use or what specific policy you would use. It simply requires that you have certain processes in place, you have certain policies in place, and you have certain training available. In essence, it asks questions about whether you have processes in place for inbound software, development, and outbound software. It asks if you have an open source policy. It asks if you have open source training. It can be conceptualized as being very similar to existing standards in areas like ISO. Open chain conformance allows companies to double check that they meet the requirements of the specification. As the specification is relatively high level, conformance is something that is not incredibly difficult to do, not incredibly complex to do, but does require a certain degree of clarity in thinking about how your organization is implementing processes and policies. The conformance is available in two ways. One, as an online self-certification questionnaire which allows companies to quickly and easily check their conformance without any specialist in-house uh, self-certification team. The second is a manual self-certification document, which can be used by companies that don't want to use an online system and want to use their in-house resources to double check if they meet the specifications requirements. Now, as I mentioned, the actual specification of OpenChain, our keystone, does not contain the details of what a specific process or specific policy should be. It doesn't contain the details of what an educational program should be around open source compliance in the supply chain. The OpenChain curriculum is the area where we put some of this knowledge. We don't put it there to be canonical. We don't put it there to be the one source of truth. This is the correct process. This is the correct policy. But we put materials into the curriculum to show people this is a reference example of how you might address this process challenge in a small company or an enterprise. This is a reference example of how you might train people. This is a reference example of an open source policy. The curriculum started with essentially a, a slide deck containing 72 slides as a reference training program for open source and open source compliance. This set of slides was distilled from very generous knowledge donations from companies like Samsung, Qualcomm, Arm, and Royal Philips Electronics. It became incredibly popular and incredibly successful very quickly. In fact, when we released the curriculum material, we thought it would be used purely to support a certain aspect of the specification, the training requirement. Do you have a training program? We thought that would be a bottleneck. We thought we'd provide a reference training program. And suddenly, people began adopting it not only for OpenChain, but for everything. Because it's under CC0 licensing, it is, in effect, public domain. And we're seeing a tremendous amount of pickup in all types of areas as people pick and mix the training program and integrate it into their existing companies or nonprofit organizations. But there's a lot more to the curriculum now. 
because as OpenChain has gained mind share, we've received donations from all types of angles, from companies, from NGOs, from individuals, giving us reference documentation on processes, on policies, as well as education. I would just give a brief shout out to the latest version of our education slides. It's now a deck of 80 slides with eight chapters. At the end of each chapter, a little bit of an examination. It's a very interesting tool for sharing knowledge about open source. Moving on a little bit. The goal of the Open Chain project is pretty simple and pretty clear. We want to build trust by having organizations conformant with the Open Chain specification. If someone is conformant with the specification, we can know that they have certain key requirements implemented that indicate they have a quality open source compliance program. It doesn't guarantee that they will be doing everything right, but it's a strong indicator that they are matching the expected industry levels of quality and approach. We have seen terrific adoption around this concept. In just the past six months, the Open Chain project has seen over 50 over 50% increase in our platinum membership. We've had five major companies come on board. Last month, two new ones. These new companies range from Toyota in the automotive sector, Sony in embedded electronics, Hitachi in infrastructure, Comcast in telecommunications. They cover all types of ground, all types of places. And we have seen terrific pickup momentum around the idea that the Open Chain Project can solve many of the significant problems that we face today. And not everyone involved in Open Chain, in our new Platinum members, is involved in areas like, let's say, automotive and consumer electronics. Some people are involved in much lower levels of the supply chain, like Western Digital. What we see is that everyone, everywhere, using open source, has been waiting for the idea of having a simple shared approach to making sure that we all do open source compliance predictably. We have seen our community of conformant organizations begin to grow. Six months ago, we had one organization conformant, Wind River, and now we have 15, and we're about to see increased uptick in the future. I'll cover that in a minute. The key to having the community of conformance grow was, in essence, putting the self-certification questionnaire online. All types of companies began to look at it and began to fill it out. And as of today, these are 15 conformance, but we have other companies currently going through the questionnaire and going through the process. What was really interesting and really important about this particular point is that the organizations that became open chain conformant were not just multinationals. They were not just enormous companies. For example, we do have enormous companies like Qualcomm that are conformant, but we also have smaller entities conformant. One good example is Pelagicor, represented by Jeremiah there in the side of the room. The open chain spec, as it was designed and as it turned out, is perfectly adoptable by organizations of any size because it is not enforcing a strict single process or a strict single policy. You can use your own. We have also seen the beginning of a large increase in internationalization. Now this is something that Dave referenced when he was introducing this talk. It's that we must have an international project if we want to address the global supply chain. And We've seen volunteers from all over the world come together to help us translate the specification, to help us translate the curriculum, to help us translate other materials. As of today, we have eight official translations of the specification. We have two further translations underway. And we have further translations being mooted in the pipeline, all of them conducted by volunteers on their own time. It's been incredible how we've seen that engagement and where that's taking us next. As Dave said, we currently have 14 companies supporting OpenChain. And I'm, I'm quite excited about the diversity of the companies, from chipset companies 
to consumer electronic companies to automotive companies. It's, it's a nice widespread. And because we have such a diversity of companies inside Open Chain as Platinum members, we truly have a global picture of the type of requirements people want to fulfill. Quick example is that Sony's life cycle on consumer electronics is about two to five years, depending on what they're talking about. Toyota's life cycle on cars, you're looking at something more similar, 10 to 20 years. Hitachi and Siemens doing infrastructure, you're looking at 30 to 50 years. All of these companies face very different challenges. And when they're thinking about their supply chains, when they're thinking of what type of open source compliance they need, they have a diversity of asks. And we managed to cover that diversity by having a broad-based specification and multiple reference tools. The big elephant in the room, of course, is that we need to bring our Chinese colleagues, uh, Chinese stakeholders of all types and all sizes into open chain, given the tremendous market growth and the tremendous market power of many of the entities in that region. The same applies to India, where we're seeing terrifically large companies doing amazing things with open source. You can expect us to be having increased dialogues with potential Asian stakeholders over the next year. Our Japanese stakeholders, represented by many parties, including Toyota, a gentleman from Toyota is in the audience today, are going to kindly help us frame our approach into the overarching Asian region. Now, of course, if Open Chain was just large companies chatting, it would not really be an effective solution. Open Chain is supported by very large companies, but it is a very vibrant and very diverse community. We have four work teams that support the Open Chain project. Specification, the work team which actually writes the spec document, is headed by Mark Giese from Wind River. The last version of the specification had over 100 individual contributors submit comments on how it could be simplified, improved, and made as comprehensive as possible without becoming complex. The conformance work team, of course, is the team that builds out the online and the manual self-certification. That's headed up by Miriam Balhausen. She's a German lawyer. She works with the Software Compliance Academy. And she is representative of a, a small group in Germany of experts around open source compliance. The curriculum is headed up by Alexius from Intel. And he's gathering tons of material, both donated and sourced internally in the project, on GitHub, which is being curated into multiple reference packs for everyone to use. The curr curriculum work team is pretty active. Um, we have got quite a few participants, and we indeed had to break it off into a separate mailing list due to the level of traffic at one point. Finally, we have an onboarding work team, and this is about, obviously, bringing people into the project. Uh, the onboarding work team is there to ensure that the echo chamber of all of us working together in open chain does not become uh, something that causes a barrier to entry. We want to make sure that our material, when people visit the website, when people get our leaflets, brings them from the beginning to the end of why this is a good idea. And they're doing tremendous work. Um, Nathan, the chair of it, is from Qualcomm. And um, I believe he's a relatively new gentleman in Qualcomm. He's been tremendously active in our project and has donated a great deal of time, in much the same way as Dave um, donated a great deal of time to the Freedom Task Force in the early days. It, it seems there's a certain way you can hook people and make them work for free. Now, coming in 2018, we've got a lot more going on. Um, supply chain adoption is the obvious one. I said the community of conformance is going to increase dramatically. Uh, that is a certainty because our platinum members are planning to step up and introduce open chain more in depth and more comprehensively to their individual supply chains. Companies like Siemens are very interested in making sure that their suppliers are aware of open chain and their suppliers are aware of the advantages of synchronizing everyone into having the same basic approaches to open source compliance. 
That's one of the highlights, I think, to watch for in the next year. We spent a lot of time preparing this year. We spent a lot of time bringing in new Platinum members, preparing our onboarding material, improving our educational material. And that was all about getting to the point where we are now into large-scale market deployment. We're going to have new reference material in 2018. The specific reference material we'll have really depends on the call of the uh, curriculum work team. So they're getting a lot of material uh, pledged or actively donated into the work team, and they're sorting through it and deciding what is appropriate for using. Words like checklist are becoming more and more frequent, and I think we're going to see a lot of that. To Evan's point that we need to have checklists and teach people how to use them, we're on that. And what we'll do is prioritize what checklists we need first. We're also going to have a specification review process in 2018. The process formally kicks off uh, now, and we'll have a formal review around April, when we'll decide if we're going to do a version bump on the spec in 2018 or not. When it comes to our specification, because we're looking at a large picture, and it takes a while for people to adopt something like an industry standard, we obviously don't want to iterate too quickly. At the same time, we don't want to iterate once every 15 years. We want to make sure we stay on top of where the market's rolling and that we are inclusive to all viewpoints moving forward. Quick example is that our first major automotive players coming on board, Toyota, obviously, Hitachi is another one, are bringing some perspectives from the automotive industry that might help inform how we could refine the spec. We want to make sure that we are able to integrate those perspectives in a realistic and useful manner. Now, everyone is welcome to be part of this. Open Chain is a project with around 170, 180 people on our main mailing list. It's open to everyone from any type of organization, whether it's an NGO or a commercial entity. While we focus on essentially providing the commercial entities with a way to address their supply chains, we want to make sure that we include a diversity of voices in how we approach that. We want to make sure that we are going to be suiting every constituent suiting every stakeholder as best possible, while maintaining the idea that our ultimate goal is simple. We want to make sure that open source is available for everyone to adopt, it's easy to understand, and we all play by the same rules. Now, being part of this, uh, it obviously means potentially self-certifying or joining our mailing list. We have a lot of stuff going on every day. Uh, for example, today, uh, I'd like to more publicly announce that we're doing three interesting things this week. The first is that our website has been updated and hopefully made much easier to use and understand, thanks to the Linux Foundation's creative team. They're absolutely superb. The second is that our Japanese translation team have just released a new Japanese version of our curriculum training materials. And the third is that we are experimenting with ways that OpenChain can go further in the future. Our specification chair, Mark Giese, has just begun a little side project with SPDX, OpenChain, and the blockchain. And his concept is to have a ledger where you could record and monitor things throughout the supply chain using blockchain technology. This idea has gained some traction. Uh, it's got reference source code available. And later this month in Japan at the Open Compliance Summit, Mark will formally launch the actual uh, project. What we have now is a request for comments. Lots of stuff going on. Everyone's welcome. And there are no real barriers to entry except that you need to sign up for our mailing list if you want to be part of this. As soon as people arrive, they let us know what they want to do, and we're very happy to help guide them, bring them into the work teams, and make sure they're fully up to speed. OpenChain is part of addressing the questions that were raised today. It's a solution for making sure that we have systemic approaches, that we have a way to consolidate everyone, and in doing so, we make everything cheaper, quicker, and more efficient. 
Well, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for your time. Happy to take questions, though I am aware that we are pushing our boundaries a little, and Mike Dolan wants to get up and talk about the Linux kernel enforcement. Oh, it's not only that. It's that I have learned over years of running this conference that if you delay people's lunch, you're <laughs> interfering with learning to an exorbitant extent. Um, I, 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 let's, just, uh, let's just say that uh, both Shane and Dave will be here all day long, and you should talk to them. Um, the question, how do you do uh, stewardship of shared resources uh, in a way which respects constitutional autonomy is with process. Um, I, the modesty of Shane's uh, process genius is very modest indeed, uh, but the ambition is enormous. Uh, we will, within a very short period of time, uh, have solved in parallel thousands of problems. The one point in which I think Shane's modesty is maybe inappropriate is that uh, the modesty of saying that supply chains are long and complicated uh, doesn't fully account for the fact that they're also interlocked. Uh, when uh, a few of the world's major consumers in midstream are all committed to open chain, then they are cleaning up not just their own supply chains, but everybody else's supply chains too, because everybody supplies everybody. The consequence of this is that we can, in parallel, resolve actually thousands of compliance issues all at once by a form of compliance which is spontaneous and uncoerced. People signing up to provide in the layer of industrial process what is necessary uh, but which we no longer need to compel. This is the only way that we can resolve matters without costs, orders of magnitude higher than we can afford, both in resources and in loss of solidarity. This may be the most important architectural advance in the direction of how we treat licenses as shared resources since we began making licenses through transparent public processes a decade ago. I think it's impossible to overstate the importance of this. I think it's also therefore impossible to overstate why if Shane calls you up and asks you to throw away time and effort on improving the future, you should believe him. The future will get better if you help. Thanks very much. Thank you indeed. Thank you.